which statement is true? You're never too old to learn or can't teach an old dog new tricks. Which one's true? Because they're the opposite. The answer is it depends on the situation. And you need wisdom to know the difference. So we are in a message series on Sunday morning called Words of Wisdom from the book of Proverbs in the Bible. There's a whole book of the Bible that's just dedicated to wisdom. And we need wisdom more than ever today. We are living in what's often called the information age. You literally have all the information in the world at your fingertips in a moment. You could even just tell your phone, phone, get me that info, and it will just do it. But all the information in the world does not make us wise. We don't know what to do with that information. And so God has the wisdom that you and I need for every situation in life. So I'm super pumped about this message series. I'm really excited about today's message, uh, in fact. Today I want to talk to you about four ways that you can gain the most benefit from the book of Proverbs. So four ways. Look for four ways that you can gain the most um, benefit, the most return on investment from the book of Proverbs. And then I'm going to take one of the, my favorite passages from the book of Proverbs and just use those four ways to draw out the meaning for us. And I hope that that will inspire you to do the same thing. So the very first one is notice the poetry. Notice the poetry. So the, if you're uh, using a, a modern translation of the Bible, you probably see that when you open to the book of Proverbs, and if you want to do that in, in preparation, that, that'd be great. You look at the book of Proverbs, and most of it has the, uh, it doesn't have the, f the full width of, the, of each line of text. It's, it's poetic. It's centered. And they're trying to show you, hey, this is poetry. And so it's important to notice that. And we're not talking just about a bunch of memes or some trite cliches. So a cliche is just an overused uh, phrase that may or may not mean anything. But the, the book of Proverbs is written in a poetic style to help you remember it. It's very intentional. The original hearers of this probably did not even have the Bible written down in their hand. That, that would have been a very uh, a luxurious item to have a scroll of the Bible in your own possession. And so the, this, the book of wisdom was written it poetically to help you remember it and apply it to your life. Uh, so I, I think about the, the junior poet laureate of the United States uh, a, a while back, Amanda Gorman. So she, she wrote a poem called The Hill We Climb, and it, it was a, 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 a got her to the place where she was able to read that, the youngest poet ever to read at an inauguration of a president. It's pretty amazing, and I, I remembered that because it's poetic. It's poetry, like, oh, that stuck with me, and it had some meaning. That, that poem has been analyzed all over the internet, what, what it means and what the context was and all that stuff. Proverbs in the Bible, wisdom written down poetically, impart real wisdom to you as you wrestle through. What does this poem mean? As you analyze, well, that's, that's said in a catchy way, but why, what does this mean? What, what is it trying to say for me? And in the book of Proverbs, we see Hebrew poetry. You know, there are different, po different poetic styles from different countries. God's people were the Hebrews, so Jewish poet, poetry. And they use two main sort of poetic tools. The first one is parallels. They use parallels. So when you're reading the book of Proverbs, look for parallel statements. Usually it's just one verse, so like verse number 12 or whatever, will have two phrases, two lines, and those lines are in parallel. And that is a, that's like a main way the poets of that day wrote. And so the two phrases tend to do one of two things. They either agree with each other, and the second phrase, like, magnifies what that first one says, expands it, explains it. Or, typically, the second phrase 
con- or is the counterpoint. It's the contrast. It means something, the second phrase is something very different. And yet, those two phrases go together, they're in parallel to teach you something. Sometimes the first statement is very bold, like, always do this, period. And the second phrase will contrast and sort of soften it a little bit, temper it a little bit. Oh, okay. Or sometimes the second phrase will help you realize, oh, this is what the first phrase meant. It's sort of like it limits it. Oh, it's not just saying in every situation. It's saying in this situation. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you in just a moment with, with a, a passage from Proverbs that where we'll work it out. But just notice parallels. Two, there are sets of two phrases that go together in the book of Proverbs. And then another one is word pictures. And we use a lot of word pictures in our language too. Uh, but they, they'll, they'll have, in, in the book of Proverbs, he'll have like a metaphor or just a picturesque word. And the, the reason it's there is to get you and I to stop and go, oh, how is this concept, this wisdom concept, like that picture? Now, it'd be easy to go, well, uh, here's one way. But this is what I want to challenge you. As you're reading through the book of Proverbs and as we read through it together uh, on Sundays, come up with 10 ways it's like that. And then get your mind to just go, oh, oh, wow, okay, wisdom is like a schoolmaster. Well, what does that mean? Well, a schoolmaster is prepared. A schoolmaster is imparting wisdom to the learners. Well, a schoolmaster really cares about the, it's not just about the schoolmaster, it's about developing something in the student. It's student, a schoolmaster is student focused. Well, you, when you start going, oh, how are all the ways that this is like that, whenever you see a picture or whenever you see a metaphor in the word, again, you wrestle through to wisdom. We don't just read. It's easy, especially in the book of Proverbs. It's just easy to just read, 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 because it's just a bunch of short things. But the point is to stop, wrestle through it, and say, God, what are you saying? How is this like that? Or what, what are you saying to me? Okay, there's a second thing to get the, uh, the biggest benefit out of the book of Proverbs. Observe the whole mosaic. Observe the whole mosaic. This whole book is poetic, but the first several chapters are sort of different. They, are, uh, they tend to be uh, like a whole chapter or a whole part of a chapter on a certain topic. But you get after chapter 10 or chapter 10 and on, it is a bunch of random, seemingly unrelated parallels, unrelated verses where it's just verse, uh, idea, 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 idea. And so in order to get the most out of the book of Proverbs, you can't just go up front and only focus on one verse. It's going to be incomplete. And I've got a picture of a mosaic to show you just a part of a mosaic. Now, this, this is part of a bigger one. I don't say this out loud, but just try to imagine what's the picture. What's this the picture of? I'm going to show you in a few minutes what it is. But when you look at that, don't say it out loud. What do you suppose that is? It is a bunch of little squares. I don't know if that's tile. Typically, a mosaic is tile. Little chopped up, broken pieces put on in a certain way to make a beautiful picture. But if you get too close, you're not seeing the whole picture. And you actually may even get a little off track. If you take, if you isolate one verse of the Bible, even outside of Proverbs, if you isolate one verse of the Bible, a, a friend of mine was talking before service today, and, and she was saying, what do, you, what do you think about this? And she was talking about a specific passage, and I said, well, we, I'm so glad that she, she quoted two different passages that seem to say something different. Right, that's what you got to do. You got to take the whole picture and see what is God's wisdom on that topic. Uh, so you might even discover that uh, two, uh, two, two Proverbs, they might be next to each other or they might be in different places, seem to say the opposite things. Now, we have this in our modern English language too. And I started, with, I started this message with it. But some other examples of opposite Proverbs. Look before you leap. He who hesitates is lost. We, we go, wait a minute, those are two opposite truths. One says, don't wait, just 
just, just jump. The other says, wait, look first. Uh, another set is, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Oh, I'm away from my loved one. I just miss him so much. But the other one is, out of sight, out of mind. While the cat's away, the mice play. Like, there's so many opposite truths. Another one is, it's better to be safe than sorry. It's better to be safe than sorry. So make sure you take the safe route. But the opposite is, nothing ventured, nothing gained. No risk, no reward. Wait, how can, how can they be opposite? We are tempted when we see something like, like that in the Bible to go, oh, one of them must not be true. So a, a great example from Proverbs is Proverbs 26, verses 4 to 5. Verse 4, this is my favorite set of verses. Verse 4, don't, somebody say don't. Don't, don't answer the foolish arguments of fools, or you will become as foolish as they are. Verse number five, be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools or they will become wise in their own estimation. So we see this and we go, aha, I, Garen, found the one loophole in the Bible. And this proves that none of the Bible is true because I found the contradiction. That's not how you approach the book of Proverbs and it's not how you approach the Bible. The Bible is a mosaic. If you get up really close, you would say, oh, wow, it's a triangle. <laughs> when you get back and you look at the whole big picture, you realize, oh, it is a beautiful collection of broken pieces that fit together in a beautiful picture, a beautiful description of a certain topic. So no one proverb by itself gets you the whole picture. You need to see them all together and then figure out which situation applies to you prayerfully. So I want to show you the whole mosaic. Let's show that, that picture of that. I showed you a part. That's the whole mosaic. But if you just looked at just that little bit that I showed you, just a little bit of the stomach area or the chest area, you would just go, well, this doesn't make any sense. The Bible doesn't make any sense. Or, or, wow, it must be a little triangle, it must be a square. No, there's, it's part of a whole. We are together as a church, we have a Bible reading plan. And it's, it's on our website, it's on the app, we have it printed in paper copies for you out on a lobby table right now. And it is on purpose taking us one chapter a day to read through the entire Bible in three years. It's a three-year plan. We've never done it exactly like this before. And right now, we've got some uh, Book of Romans. We had some Book of Exodus. Now we've got a little Book of, of Leviticus. We've got some Psalms. We've got some, some Proverbs kind of sprinkled in there because we want to hear the whole Bible so that we can be wise in God's eyes. That was, we want to live life the way he provided. So it, here, here's what I mean. When you're looking at Proverbs, Read, if you want to know what Proverbs says about health, read all the verses in, in Proverbs that talk about health. If you want to see what God says about relationships, read all the verses. It might be one verse in this chapter. It might be another verse in this other chapter. But read, if you want to know what, the, what God's wisdom is on a topic, read all the verses on that topic. It's so easy. Go to BibleGateway.com and just search for the word marriage. And then you will see all of the verses in the Bible that have that word in it, all right? And that, that's what we're talking about. And it, you could narrow your search and just say, which one's in Proverbs? And that's, that's a great way to see what God says about a certain topic. Okay, ver, ver, number three, how to get the most benefit from the book of Proverbs. Use the book of Proverbs as God's manual for a great life. It's not just an intellectual textbook. So I, I, I started to write that, and then I realized, no. It's an instruction manual to have a great, successful life. So use it like that. Uh, our family has a long history of buying IKEA furniture. <laughs> we even have certain phrases that I have spouted during that assembly that have become a part of our family lore. Uh, I, I, but I can't, I just won't say it now. No, I won't, I won't go there. I don't want to offend all the Swedish people. <laughs> and I tell you what, I, there have been times when I, when I go, I got this. 
I put together IKEA furniture before. I don't need no instruction manual. And I'll get in and like I'll just I I know how this works. I know what a cam bolt is. I know how to put it in there. And, and yet if I just sort of skip ahead, I'll realize, oh, you're supposed to do this before doing that. Yeah. And I, oh, I needed those screw those uh, those tools or whatever. The guy, the guy right there, that he's crossed off. That's been me a few times. And then I just have to get out the the manual, undo all the things I did, start and do it in the correct order, and and that's kind of how the how the Bible is, man. You could just say I got this. I know how to live life. But then sometimes you're going to have to, you're, you're going to, have to backtrack a little bit <laughs> if you had only known first. And I just want to mention uh, one thing here, uh, especially with a modern audience. I just want you to, to, to see this. On the, on, the, on the surface, the book of Proverbs seems to be only for men. If you notice, almost always in the, within the book of Proverbs, he says, pay attention, my son, Pay attention, my son. He says that over and over again. Um, he says, like, you know, watch out for the wayward woman, son, stuff like that. But, but don't use that to jump to the conclusion that this part of the Bible is only for sons or only for men. For example, in Proverbs 1.8 and, and a bunch of other verses like this, it's, it talks about it's the father and mother who instruct the kids. It's not, wisdom is not just a guy thing. Um, Bruce Waltke, an author, said the mother was an authoritative voice along with the father. And so that implies that sons and daughters were trained in wisdom uh, and in the wisdom of Proverbs so that the mothers could grow up and be wise and teach that wisdom to their kids. The Proverbs 31 woman uh, that I talked about a couple weeks ago, we started this series with, said, verse 26 says, when she speaks... Her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. The, the, a Jewish woman, a woman of God, was expected to be wise and trained in wisdom, and this is a book of wisdom. It just happens to be written by a king, Solomon, who had in mind, I need to prepare the next king. And so he often addressed him for that, but, but uh, is part of God's word, and it is intended for everyone. Even within the book of Proverbs, we see how women are, are expected to be wise. Women are expected to be wise enough to be teachers. It is a group thing, all right? So it, I, I just want to make sure that, that everyone knows you're included. All right, another way to get the most benefit out of the book of Proverbs, follow the signposts to Jesus. Follow all the signposts to Jesus. Here's the thing. The whole Bible tells one story. And it's one of the reasons, it's one of the many, many proofs or evidences that the Bible is God's word. It is amazing that this, this, the book of the Bible is divided up into, into, into segments or books within it. Those books were written over thousands of years by different authors, and yet they all tell one story that agrees. That is miraculous. Yeah. That is amazing. And it's because the Holy Spirit of God guided the writing of the Bible all the way through from the beginning. The, the one story is this. Humanity sinned, and when we sinned, we turned away from God, all of creation became broken or flawed, and there was nothing that we could do to, to make up for it or to fix it ourselves. We needed salvation, and so God sent his only son, Jesus, his unique son, to come and be the savior of the world. So he gave his life on the cross to pay for the, the punishment for our sins. The whole Bible points to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Every bit of it points to Jesus. Sometimes you have to look a little bit like, oh, wow, okay. There, there, I see now how that points to Jesus. And Proverbs is no exception. It, uh, um, it, like, for example, in the New Testament, in Luke eleven thirty one, 31, Jesus said, said these words as he was preaching. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, and you won't listen to me. 
Solomon was wise enough, we call him the wisest man ever, and he got to write down the book of Proverbs. And Jesus said, yeah, and he points to me because I'm actually wiser than Solomon because Jesus is God. So even in the wisdom of Proverbs, it points to the wiser one, the greater Solomon, Jesus. And Paul wrote in Colossians 2, verse 3, in the New Testament as well, in Jesus lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you're looking for wisdom, look at Jesus. That is where you're going to see wisdom embodied. So even Proverbs points to Jesus. So now, I want to just take, that's just a, a little bit of introductory, uh, uh, but I was, I was pretty excited about it. I, it's, it's helpful to me. I thought it might be helpful to you. Let's look at a, as a passage. So if you have your Bible, why don't you turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. One of the most quoted, best love passages in all of Proverbs. And as we do, as we look at it together, I want you to be able to see the meaning in it that I see. When you read the Bible on your own, I want you to be able to, along with the help of the Holy Spirit, see all the meaning and all the inspiration and all the correction and all the application possible. Let's not just be readers of the Bible. We have a saying here. We live and love the Bible. We live and love the Bible. It means that much to us. So I want to equip you to love the Bible on your own and to live it on your own. All right? Uh, so we're going to look for poetic parallels. We're going to look for word pictures. We're going to step back from the mosaic. We're going to look at the whole. We're going to apply this instruction manual to your life, and we're going to discover how it points to Jesus. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. There's the first parallel right there. Two phrases that go together. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. I want to read the same verses out of another translation. Just, just kind of drill it down. Get it into us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. So just two, uh, two different translations of that original Hebrew poetry for us to see. So let, let's, let's look at some parallels. Like for the first one, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Okay, you guys, this is a very important concept for your life. This is not just a church thing. Like, this can make a difference in your life. So there's a lot of things that just sort of seem like, well, that's, that makes sense. That's logical. But it's not God's way. And when we do those things, we often get ourselves in trouble. And all of a sudden, we're not living that successful life that we were hoping to live. So two, this, this one is a contrast. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then the contrast, do not depend on your own understanding. So the second part explains the first. When he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, you begin to think, well, what does that mean? How do I trust in the Lord with all my heart? Like, how do I do that practically? The second part says, don't depend on your own understanding. That's like one facet, one little teeny piece of the mosaic that helps you figure out how to trust in the Lord. One way to do that is don't just assume you're right. Question your own motives. <laughs> Question your own logic, your own experience, your own interpretation of how the world is and how your world is. Do you see how the, just the poet, poetry and the parallels, like that helps you to begin to understand. I see some word pictures here. He used the word heart. Well, we know he's not talking about a muscle that pumps blood. So this is a picture. 
This is, this, there's a picture here. So we're supposed to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Well, what does that mean? Well, it must mean going beyond just reading something and going, oh yeah, that's right. It is getting your emotions into it. It's getting your will into it. It's bringing your whole self into it and going, you know what? I'm taking a step here. I'm standing on my faith in Jesus. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to be happy about it. I'm going I'm to rejoice about it. I'm going to be serious about it. I'm going to tell someone about it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. Don't depend on yourself. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom, it said in verse 7. So we're going to notice those things and and then just say, uh, 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 another one is like path. He says, and he, he will show you which path to take. Well, why would he say path? I mean, why does that matter? Which trail do I take to the store? Like, what, what, what do you, oh, path. He's talking about your life. Well, in what ways, name 10 ways, your life is like a path. Oh, wow, okay, 10 ways. Oh, paths uh, sometimes divide, and there will be choices in my life. Oh, so at choice points, that's where I need to trust in the Lord with all my heart. Oh, paths sometimes get very steep and difficult. Oh, so I should trust in the Lord with all my heart when life is hard. Sometimes in a path, there will be a hole or a rock, and that could make you stumble and get hurt and and take you out of the hike. Oh, so my life is like a path, so I need to trust the Lord and have my eyes on Him so I don't stumble, so I don't get injured and taken out of the game. Do you see what I mean? That's like three ways, and I literally thought of those right here on the spot. I didn't take the time ahead of time. What if we wrestle through with the truths of God's Word like that? And begin to, then next time you face a stumble point, next time you face a choice point, you go, oh, I know what to do. This is an opportunity to trust in the Lord with all my heart and not lean on my own understanding. Because my own understanding says, freak out! But I don't need to do that. Instead, that's the parallel, instead I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart. So look at this, uh, the last verse I read, verse 8, says, then, if you do those things, then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. I will. I will not have a cold. I will not have an ache. I will not have anything wrong in my whole body as long as I trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know what that's doing? That's looking at one little broken triangle of the mosaic. Remember what I said about health? Step back. Look at the whole picture of what is God doing in your life. Start by looking at every verse on your physical life, your body, length of days. Look at Proverbs for all of those together and begin to see the mosaic. Oh, it's more than just one little teeny thing. In other words, don't just stop here, build a doctrine, uh, build a church, don't just stop here on one little verse. The Bible actually has a lot to say about, uh, about troubles in your life, about physical health. So we, we've, got, we've, got to, we've got to look at it all. But we do know this, every, every promise is true. And I'm going to come back to this promise uh, in just a minute. But every promise is true, it's just when. And that's why we've got to read the whole Bible. All right, so what other verses reveal different perspectives on healing? And then where, how does this passage from Proverbs 3, 5 to 8, point to Jesus? Well, trust in Jesus. Learn from his life choices. God became man and dwelt among us. So we can see what did Jesus do when he was criticized? Oh, I can get wisdom by looking to Jesus. What did he do when everyone was, was criticizing him? Oh, okay, we can see how he responded. We can respond like that and get wisdom. What did Jesus do when he faced a life choice? What did, he, what did Jesus do when he was tempted? We sometimes forget. Jesus was tempted with evil. Well, what do, what do I do? What do you do when you're tempted to do something wrong? Look at Jesus. What did he do? And we, and we begin to pattern our life after him. I can tell you what he did. He looked the devil in the eye and said, get out of here. And this is what God's word said. And he brought God's word 
to bear on that temptation. So even this points to Jesus. This past weekend was really interesting. There were two different times when when different people in my life were facing something. So I had a friend this weekend who, who was facing something and the, the car keys were gone. And uh, that raised all kinds of concerns, like could, uh, it, does someone have the keys? Could they steal that car? And so you know what we did? We laid hands on the car and prayed that God would protect it. And God did. That was an opportunity to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out to your own. My understanding says someone's going to come and steal that car. That's my understanding. But God's word says, no, trust in the Lord. And if we had trust in the Lord, if we had prayed for that car and we trusted in the Lord and it got stolen, you know what we'd do then? We would say, I trust you, Lord. That was your car all along. I trust you. You've got a better plan. You're going to bring something good out of this. And my friend was saying words like that, like, yes, that, yes, exactly. Uh, I I had a family member who leads worship here uh, that the, uh, the garage door wasn't working and he needed to leave it unlocked overnight. And so what do we do? We, we pray and we say, Lord, I've done everything I can do. I, 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 I've done what I, I've done what I know to do now. I just ask you, Lord, would you protect me? You protect my family. Uh, that is trusting in the Lord with all your heart, not leaning to your own understanding. So if you want to be wise, biblical wisdom starts with a right relationship with the Lord. Biblical wisdom begins with a right relationship with the Lord. That does not mean that life is going to be easy or you'll never have a trouble. It just means that God is going to use everything that happens for your good. So here, this is a very important point from this, from this passage. You can trust God's wisdom. You can trust God's wisdom. That word, the, the, the root word of, of trust in that place, or Proverbs 3, 5, that root word means laying face down on the ground. That is, uh, that's something that we kind of miss because we're reading in English and not in the original language. And it has, a, it has the idea, it's an illustration of a servant bowing down before the, a master and saying, I'm ready for whatever you got next. It also has the connotation of someone who's been conquered, and like a, a, an, an army is coming in and, and conquered you, and you lay on the ground and surrender. That's part of trust. It's actually surrendering what's going on in your life to God. And I want you to know this. You can trust God's wisdom. You can. You can trust his wisdom. Don't lean on your own understanding. (laughs) So why don't we trust God's wisdom and just obey him? Why don't we trust him enough to always obey? Why don't we trust him enough to always just go to him? Well, perhaps some people in your life have let you down. And when that happens it then becomes harder to trust others. Even it can be harder to trust God because people have let you down. So maybe that's why. Or or maybe it's because God's wisdom most of the time seems upside down from the world. The the, the people of the world, the people that are not following Jesus, they tend to think in certain ways and God is just very consistent. He, his wisdom is stable, strong, and secure. It does not change when, with every new fad, with every new trend. His wisdom is solid. And just the, the, the fact of that sometimes make, makes us go, well, wow, can I, can I trust that? Because it's not the Bible. That's not how everybody else thinks. So can I trust that? That, that can be an obstacle. So God's wisdom sometimes makes us feel like awkward. Oh, wow. Okay. But you cannot trust human wisdom. You can't trust it. Yeah. It is so changeable. Oh, man, I just, I just don't even have time. But I, I even just think about uh, laws that have been passed to support God's wisdom. And then a few years later, they go, oh, Psych just changed our mind, like significant national laws. Human wisdom is just so up and down. I feel this, I feel that, I feel this, so I'm going to say this is why. God's wisdom is not like that. His his wisdom is a strong uh, rock for you to build your life on. 
And that's why Solomon writes, don't depend on your own understanding. Seek God's will in all you do. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Listen, God gave you a brain, and he expects you to use it. Be smart, okay? Like, use your brain. Don't check your brain at the door uh, if you're going to become a Christian. But also, don't just depend on your own figuring stuff out. Because so many times we say, there's no way through this. Oh, brother. But God, yes, there is a way through this. It's just not, it's just a little beyond your own understanding, because God is beyond our understanding. <laughs> so human wisdom says it's wise to hold on to everything that you get, because there's only so much to go around. But God's wisdom in, the, in Proverbs eleven twenty four says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Wow, that is upside down. That makes no sense. That is not according to my own understanding. Right. Because there are laws, higher laws that God has put into place. Uh, give freely and become more wealthy. It doesn't mean that you're going to become the next Bill Gates or something. You're going to be rich in some way. Could be rich in character. Could be rich in finances. It could be rich in hedge trimmers. There's a lot of different ways that you could be rich. <laughs> Give freely, become more wealthy. Human wisdom says, live together before marriage. Try before you buy. Who needs a party anyway? I don't need some party to say that I love this person. A party is a wedding or a reception. But God's wisdom says, you can only find the, the true, lasting, safe, protected intimacy within the commitment, the covenant of marriage. That's where you find what you're looking for. That is not according to, to human wisdom. That is, that is not the prevailing thought. But God's ways are higher. Don't lean to your own understanding. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord in this. What would happen if you just simply trust the Lord in this? How would your life be better in the long run? How would it be less broken if you trust the Lord in this. People say, well, it's okay to hold a grudge or get even. And I, the reason I say that, they, that, that's what the world says, is because of a little thing called social media. So we say, if someone ticks you off, make sure you put it in print and put it on the internet where it can be seen for every, forever by everyone, including your future boss interviewing you. It, it just absolutely makes no sense. But... To the world, it makes sense. If I'm mad, I'm going to let everybody know it. But God's wisdom says in 1 Peter 3, 9, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. That does not make sense. Right. But if you live this way, your life is better. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. How would social media change if all of us in this room only said positive things on it? Only, exclusively, 100%. How would it change? What if someone says on social media, that was a stupid sermon, and I say, you know, I hope that God's working in your life. I just, I just am praying for you. I just bless you in the name of the Lord. What, what would happen if we only said positive? That would actually line up with God's wisdom, even though it's not according to our own understanding. Do you see how I'm applying this in life? Uh, the bottom line is this. Trust God, not yourself. Trust God, not yourself. There was that, that verse right at the end that's uh, of Proverbs 3, 5 to 8 that says, you will be healthy. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. That is a promise of God. So this is true. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. This is true. You put the Lord first, you will have health, good health and strength for your bones. If you trust the Lord with all your heart. So does this promise, this verse, does it promise that all believers will be healthy, wealthy, and wise? Yes. It's a promise. Don't, don't take it out of the Bible. Yes. 
Absolutely. The promise is you put the Lord's for, Lord first, you will have health for your body and strength for your bones. That is a promise. The question is when. If you put your faith in the Lord, either in this life or the next, you're going to be whole. You're going to have a body raised incorruptible. You will have a body that cannot die, be injured, or be sick. That is a promise. So don't take this promise out of the Bible. The promise is good health, period. The question is when. So the trouble is we live in a broken world, broken by our sin, okay? Not broken by the Creator, broken by our sin. And in this broken world, the kingdom of God is here and it's not already completely here. It's now, but not yet. Here, but not completed. Jesus said 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of God is here. It's here. Absolutely. But it's not completed. There's coming a day when it will be. So you can be a faithful follower of Jesus and get cancer. My wife did a couple of different times. You can be. You can be generous and get laid off work. It can, it can happen. Sometimes we do suffer now and the rewards come later. But know this, the reward is coming. And that's part of faith. That's part of trusting in the Lord with all of your heart and not leaning to your own understanding. Your own understanding will say something like this, I'm sick, therefore God either does not love me or is not able to heal me. Mm -mm. That's your own understanding. Trust in the Lord says, Lord, I trust you. You're bigger than my problem. You're bigger than my life. You're bigger than all of it. And you are love, so I trust you. That's what trust says. And that's what faith is. If you could see it, you wouldn't need faith. Right? Absolutely. So the pattern for Proverbs promises, and we're going to get to a bunch more as we go along. The pattern for Proverbs promises is that they are the general rule now. Generally, you put the Lord first, he's going to take care of you. We heard a testimony of that earlier in the service today about the hedge trimmer. Generally, you put the Lord first, he's going to take care of you, you're going to be healthy, strong, wise, all of that. But ultimately, every promise will be fulfilled in the life to come. We have to trust that. And God is trustworthy. His word is trustworthy. He's, he's worth trusting. In, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, one of the last verses in the Bible, it says this, there's coming a day when God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever, but that day is not yet. His kingdom is here, and we're seeing people be healed, and we are seeing answers to prayer but we don't just snap our fingers and just say, God, do it right this second. We say, God, I trust you. I'm asking you to do this thing and give me the grace until it's done. Does that make sense? That's how, that's how you read the Bible. That's how you read Proverbs. So trust God, not yourself, and you'll be healthy. That's a, that's a Bible promise. And we're going to take that to heart. Would you stand to your feet? Would you pray with me? Would you just bow your heads? If you're online, make sure you pray too. Let's just focus on the Lord. Let's turn our, our eyes and our, our hearts to Him. Lord, we have a healthy reverence for You. We fear the Lord. The way a loved child fears a loving father. We reverence you. We're in awe of you, Lord. And we know your ways are better. 
even when they don't make sense to us. Your ways are better because you are love. You don't do anything out of hatred or spite. You are love. And so we trust you, Lord. Help us to trust you. <laughs> we trust you. Help us to trust you. Lord, we put our faith in you. We hold your hand and we walk through whatever comes in life. Lord, I pray that you would show me and show us where in our lives we're leaning to our own understanding. So we don't want to do that anymore. Show us where we're just drifting down the river of culture, believing what everyone else believes, and missing out on your best. Show us, Lord. Show us where we're leaning on our own understanding and help us instead to trust you, Lord. Show us which path to take. Some of us are at a choice point, a crossroads, a fork in the road. Some of us need to make a decision. Lord, show us which path to take as we trust in you, which is your promise in this passage today, Lord. Lord, we seek your will. In that choice, we've, some of us have been thinking just about how this, this or that choice benefits me. Lord, I pray you'd help us to instead seek your will in that. Maybe you're asking us actually to do, to do the harder thing or the more sacrificial thing for some reason. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to seek your will in all we do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With your head still bowed, I just want to give you an, an invitation to put your faith in Jesus. I, I don't know where you're at spiritually. You're, I can tell you this, though. You're either moving closer to the Lord or farther from him. There is no neutral. I want to invite you today to put your faith in Jesus, to say, Lord, I'm going to trust in your wisdom, not my own understanding. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you an opportunity to turn from evil and turn to the Lord. How, how, do, you, how do you put your faith in Jesus? Turn away from your sins. Those, those wrong things that keep you from God and turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. Follow his wisdom and his spirit. You want to do that today? Do you want to become a Christian? Put your faith in Jesus? If so, would you just raise your hand as a, just a sign to say, Pastor, yeah, pray for me. And that's cool, you guys. Yep, that's cool. Yep. That's awesome. And I, I, that's awesome. And I suspect there's some folks online as well, several in the room, some of you kind of making a recommitment and some of you for the first time putting your faith in Jesus. A church, would you just help me uh, pray out loud? And if, if you just raise your hand to Jesus, would you pray this prayer to him? But I'm, I'm going to coach you. So repeat after me, but say it to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. I, invite I invite you into my life. Into my life. I, acknowledge I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Please, forgive Please forgive me of my sin, and make me new. I choose to follow you, your wisdom, from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you've just raised your hand, if you put your faith in Jesus, make sure you take the following Jesus course. So I think Pastor will tell us a little bit more about that. That's right. Thank you, Pastor Garen. What a great message. Just in, insightful into the book of Proverbs and just how God speaks to us, not only through Proverbs, but through the whole Bible. Thank you. Well, if you did fill out that Connect card, I encourage you to just put it in that box right in the back on your way out so we can connect with you. And if you did accept Jesus or if you are newer to the faith, I encourage you, please stop by the Following Jesus booth in the, in the lobby. I'll be there. We have a free book, a free course for you. Just to, it's, it's seven steps, seven really easy steps, easy to read, easy to learn on how to follow Jesus well and how, how to walk beside him and, and, and follow him as, as he leads you. So I encourage you to check that out. All right. Well, we'll see you next week in person or online. God bless.